define John Jenny's political career, he found himself forced to take a public stand on slavery. In August 1831, the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion in Southampton County, Virginia occurred, resulting in the deaths of um, about 60 whites and, and dozens of African Americans in retaliation. This in turn prompted the Virginia State Legislature to spend January and February 1832 actually debating the viability of slavery in Virginia. Should Virginia keep slavery or was it too dangerous? It's really, it's an unprecedented and sort of amazing moment in Virginia history. Um, in December 1831, so in, in advance of this, there was a public meeting at the Loudoun County Courthouse um, and they appointed nine prominent residents to draw up a petition on this subject. Five of the committee members owned a total of 120 slaves. The other four, including John Danny at this time, owned none. And the petition actually urged the General Assembly to abolish slavery in Virginia on the grounds that it was both too dangerous and actually too expensive a labor source. This does not actually convince the Virginia State Legislature. I think we're all probably aware of the fact that they did not vote to abolish slavery in Virginia in 1832. Um, and what's interesting, though, is that, that John Janney sort of goes along with this. He, he doesn't remain committed to ab abolition in any sort of way. Um, on the contrary, tax records show that he purchased his first slave in 1834 and a second one in 1836. He seems to have acquired a third slave uh, sometime during the early 1840s, and then in 1850 bought the only uh, slave whose name at least I was able to uncover, a woman named Harriet Jackson, who served as the Janney's housekeeper. And seeing that giant fireplace in their kitchen, I feel for, for anyone who had to cook in that. I always also, um, uh, perhaps because I'm the mother of, of two boys, Laundry occupies a big part of my brain space, and so when I, when I talk to my students, I'm always sort of emphasizing how much work the laundry was <laughs> in the 19th century. So, at any rate, Janney owned four slaves. I believe he may have owned as many as five by 1860. Janney, though, could not be both a slaveholder and a Quaker, and so he decided to leave the Society of Friends at some point in the 1830s. The Jannies joined uh, St. James Episcopal <coughs> Church in Leesburg. Not surprisingly, the same church to which Richard Henderson belonged. Uh, there's also some evidence that Janney was probably influenced in this by his wife. Um, also not surprising though, for somebody like John Janney who owned a few slaves, who uh, did not come from a slaveholding family, he was a, a strong believer in colonization, a movement with a very long history in Latin County, uh, James Monroe, and Henry Clay were among the founders of the American Colonization Society. And Janney served as an active member of the Colonization Society of Virginia and was elected one of its vice presidents in 1855. All of these sort of aspects of Janney's background in the 1830s and 1840s and even into the 1850s really translate into a kind of fierce nationalism during 1859 and 1860 and thrust him back into the political spotlight. His last um, prior political act had been serving in the 1850-51 convention, so he sort of retired from politics in the early 1850s, only to come back in 59 and 60. He was a founding member of Loudoun's Union Party, and a lot of his unionism, and again, this is very typical for the period, had a really partisan and anti-democratic cast so that there's an element where I think a lot of Virginia unionists were unionists in part because they really just hated the Democrats and they needed a, a political home. But he was very upset with the Democratic Party. He felt that they were leading the country astray. And um, in his notes actually on the organization of the Union Party, he lamented that only one of the four 1860 presidential candidates, John Bell, the Union Party candidate, was the nominee of a national convention, and all the others were sectional. So, now we're gonna skip, it's November, 1860, presidential election. The breakdown in Loudoun County, and I, I don't have the precinct totals in hand. <laughs> yeah. 
2037 for Bell, that's the unionist candidate. Uh, 778 for Breckenridge, the southern rights candidate or the southern democrat candidate, for those of you who, who may not remember this from high school history. Um, 120 for Stephen Douglas, who's the Northern Democratic candidate, which I guess reflects <coughs> how close we are to the border. And actually, 11 votes for Lincoln, 11 brave souls. I, I'm not even sure how we got on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> Immediately after this happens, of course, uh, unionists start scrambling because South Carolina immediately calls its secession convention and the great fear is that South Carolina will secede and be followed by the Deep South states. Um, in a letter during this period, Janney expressed his disbelief that, quote, a union composed of Virginia and the cotton states would last two years. And he was angry, too. He felt that, that uh, should this happen, it would be upon the condition that we in Virginia, masters and slaves, should become hewers of wood and drawers of water for King Cotton. So he feels that, that Virginia doesn't have much in common with South Carolina, and in fact will be sort of subsumed under South Carolina. Um, he also, in the same letter, argues that he, that Virginia should quote, under no circumstance, commit herself to any line of policy tending toward the dissolution without full and free conference with the border slaveholding states of Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri. And like many unionists, actually, John Janney sees this secession winter uh, as a kind of plot by the Deep South secessionists who are trying to manipulate the border states out of the Union and into this new Confederacy. Um, so South Carolina secedes on December 20th, 1860. It's followed over the next month by the Deep South states. And in this period, Virginia finally sets um, February 13th, 1861, to be the date for its secession convention to commence in Richmond. And just as a, a quick aside, um, the reason that they have these conventions for secession has to do with the legal reasoning behind secession, which is that the way you secede from the Union is to rescind ratification of the Constitution. So just as the states had to call constitutional conventions in the 1780s, so too do they need to call these secession conventions with special elections. So on February 4th, Janney and John Carter, who was actually Loudoun County State Senator, were elected to the secession convention. And the convention is really dominated by these retired Whigs, people like John Janney, John Baldwin, um, Former Virginia Governor Henry Wise, who Janney had long um, felt animosity towards going back at least towards the 1850-51 Constitutional Convention, was among the noted Democrats in attendance. Um, the convention, what's interesting about Virginia's secession convention is how conservative it is. It is dominated by unionists. And of course, part of that is reflected in the man that they choose to be the president. And that is, of course, John Janney, in his opening address, he eloquently thanked the convention for calling him to preside over its deliberations, and he invoked the founding fathers. This is another real theme running through John Janney's life and, and politics, and stressed the importance of upholding the government that the founding fathers had created. Um, he says his earnest prayer is that this flag that the founders had created um, would remain forever, provided always that its luster is untarnished. We demand for our own citizens perfect equality of rights with those of the empire states of New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. But we ask for nothing that we will not cheerfully concede to those of Delaware and Rhode Island. And he encourages this, the delegates sitting before him to deliberate with all the due calmness and wisdom as their forebears had in Philadelphia in 1787. For the next two months, for February, March, into April, 
1861, the delegates debate the benefits and disadvantages of secession, and at the same time are trying to balance competing interests. So they send a delegation to the peace conference meeting in Washington, D.C., trying to negotiate it. At the same time, you have commissioners coming up from the states that have already seceded, trying to lobby Virginia into secession. Um, for his part, John Dandy doesn't really participate in the debates particularly. Often, uh, he's mostly concerned with keeping order, uh, particularly in the visitors' galleries, which tended to erupt into secessionist fervor. Um, his letters home, though, are full of his uh, political leanings and his opinions, and, and um, as are the letters from Alice to him, which I think are, is also what, part of what makes them such a lovely set of letters is that she's so smart and so politically aware, and so they're really talking about strategy back and forth. Um, and she also, uh, John Janney always maintained a really scrupulous concern for appearances. Alice Janney, not so much, at least in her letters to him, uh, she's quite acerbic um, against both the fire readers and Lincoln. Lincoln, she describes as the, quote, son of Satan. <laughs> uh, Jenny uh, received numerous letters from all over the state. He said he threw four-fifths of them into the fire, but, but he did answer a lot of them. Um, uh, and and uh, you know would sometimes describe them in his letters to his wife. Um, as the convention wore on into March, Janney remained optimistic. He had high hopes for the success of the Peace Congress in Washington. He believed that uh, the Virginia Convention would support it. And he said, despite a brief flare-up on Inauguration Day on March 4th, the secessionists remained in check, prompting him to observe that, quote, so far as the argument goes, the ultras have been beaten to death. They've not a plank to stand on, and if there could be a subsidence of passion and prejudice, we could close up our work here in a week. But from all indications now, there must be 50 speeches to be made, and he's frequently criticized the verbosity of the speakers, especially those favoring secession, and especially Henry Wise. <laughs> he really <laughs> He would, he would write things like, you know, if Henry Wise were here, we'd be done by now. <laughs> it's pretty funny, actually. Um, the secessionists had very little good to say about Janney either. On the contrary, effigies of him were advertised for sale in the Leesburg, Washingtonian. And uh, Alice is very upset by this. Janney takes the matter in stride and, and writes to her, he said he had fame enough. To be in Frank Leslie's, he was actually uh, portrayed in an issue of Frank Leslie's, the, the National Illustrated Newspaper. Uh, to be in Frank Leslie's and sold for seven cents ought to satisfy the ambition of any man. <laughs> and he also, uh, at one point, he's, a, he's attacked by, uh, by a, another speaker, and, and Alice writes to him, and she's all upset about it. And he says, he's a nobody from Morgan County named Duckwell who's regarded there as a pestilent four. So, you know, he sort of takes it all in stride. Um, most of his time he's occupied, of course, with the political business at hand. Finally, on April 4th, the convention voted on a resolution to remain in the Union, which passed, resoundingly, 90 to 45. Four days later, the convention voted to send a delegation to visit Lincoln personally and to quote, know whether he is for peace or war. John Janney actually opposed that. He thought it would, as he put it, do more harm than good. And his worst fears were realized on April 12th, when Confederate batteries opened fire on Fort Sumter. 